everyone. Welcome back. Finally, I can do a live again. I was imprisoned by Instagram for God knows what reasons. My name is Vera Guyash, also known as the Almost Jewish. And today I'm having a special guest and I was waiting for this interview. Waiting a lot for many reasons. Number one, after what happened on October 7th, I tried not to immediately jump on the survivors. I understood that they need time also to make sense of what have happened. Some of them were ready sooner than the others to share their experiences. And some of them are keen on to share their experiences because even after these months, since October 7th, there are people who still question that it actually happened. And I personally can't even fathom the situation that a mother who lost a child needs to hear that people from America question whether October 7th actually happened. So today I'm bringing you a special lady and when I heard her story first, she knows that I have been cried through her story and the way she, she presents her life. And she's an American-born Jewish woman who moved to Israel and she is living beside the Gaza border for the last, I think, two decades, but she's going to correct me on that. So Adela is joining us, and I see you here, Adela, so I'm going to click on bringing you in. And let's, yes, I'm accepting. I need to tell you that I don't know where she lives now, but I know that after October 7th, she, among the thousands of other Jewish people, were displaced from her home because it was destroyed. So she's been displaced. And this is something that the international community doesn't touch upon. How the Jewish people within Israel had to be displaced for the last good couple of months. We only talk about the Gazan civilians, which is heartbreaking in and of itself. But there are so many Jewish communities who are still living in other people's home, in hotels, in schools, dormitories. So let's not forget that. And I hope that you are here. Adela, are you here? I am. Okay, wonderful. So I have this technical thing again that I don't see you, which is really heartbreaking because I can't see your face. I'm going to pull you up on my computer. I don't know why my phone keeps on doing that. But can, the bottom line I can is... See you. Yes, I know. I don't know. Sometimes people see me and I don't see them. So I open here that I can just see your facial reaction and that I know that you're here. So first of all, I know it's, it's Shabbat already in Israel, so thank you for taking the time and joining us today. And I really want to give you the floor, so share with me, first of all, who you are a little bit, but also, you know, we want to dive in more into what happened on October 7th. Well, thank you for inviting me to this special Insta Live, which I'm not <laughs> used to doing. I've only done it a couple of times before so um as you said i've lived on the border with the gaza strip since 1975 i was part of a youth movement in the united states young judea and i came on a year program and after that i fell in love with the country and although i went back to the states to go to university like all good jewish children do um, in October 73, the war broke out, the Yom Kippur War, and I said, well, what am I doing in the States? Israel needs me. So that's when I made Aliyah, I came to live in Israel, and I was drafted into the army almost immediately because I was 19 and it was war. And through the army, that's how I got to where I am now, Kibbutz Nirim, okay. which was okay. a quiet, pastoral, kibbutz on the gaza border but the border was quiet then mm -hmm. and there was we used to get into cars and drive into the gaza strip to go to the beach to go shopping in the open air markets and gazans used to come in and work in our communities and it was a very different reality i did not go to live in a war zone when i came yeah i want to so i'm going to here for a second just to put you know the timeline of your life together and also where from the u.s you are from which part new york new york okay so 
You are there as a 19, 20 year old young woman. What do your parents say when you decide to go to Israel and immediately draft it to the army? So I'm, I'm pretty impressed by them. I'm an only child. Wow. So how, wow. like now as a mother, I can't fathom how they let me do that. Like I guess they didn't love me that much. <laughs> no, they, they brought me up to, uh, to march to my, my own drum. And I guess mm -hmm. they, figured that we've got to put our money where our mouth is and if she says she wants to come and live in israel then you know we're behind what she wants to do so they were amazing parents they sound like an amazing people and you know you are the living example of a good education and i will circle back on that because of what we are seeing today you know in America. But first, let's go back to your life then. So you are living this very different reality besides the border with Gaza. So we are way before Israel even pulled out the Jewish people from Gaza, right? So can you really elaborate more of like what was life back then? My children did not grow up with incoming rocket warnings. They did not grow up Although my daughter did fear, my, uh, my daughter who's now 42, she did fear infiltration from the time she was a child. And everybody told her, there's nothing to worry about. We have a fence around the kibbutz. We have a fence around the border. We have the army who are protecting us. We're in the middle of the kibbutz, you're safe. Now, if you had told me that one of my four kids was going to move back to raise her own family on Nerim. I said, I would have said, yeah, but not Lilach. Mm -hmm. So it, it was exactly Lilach who actually did that. Um, and yeah, as I said, life was beautiful and quiet. My kids slept in a children's house. Again, I don't know what, what I was thinking then, but until 99. Ninety-one. Our kids, our our kibbutz had um, children sleeping in children's houses, and wow. they would come to us at like four in the afternoon, and then go back to the children's house. We would bring them back and put them to bed in the children's house, and all the kids slept together. And hmm. that would have been an insane situation if you'd had rocket attacks at that point or infiltration, serious infiltration threats. Indeed. Wow. So when things started to change. When was that tipping point when, you know, the rocket started to hit your area? So in 2005, as you mentioned, Israel pulled out all of its Jews, dead and alive, dug up the dead ones and reburied them in Israel proper, which by the way, where I live, I live in Israel proper. It is not a contested area. It is not what they call the settlements. It is not mm -hmm. And it is not a place that was ever, ever in question. Um, so after we pulled out, I expected the Gazans to take what we left there, lots of hot houses, lots of, lots of infrastructure, and use it. Unfortunately, they used it by taking the irrigation pipes and turning them into rockets and shooting them at us. They could have made it into Singapore of the Middle East. But again, they missed an opportunity to build a country, to build, to, to build a nation for themselves. And they never, that's why I keep saying, this is not about nationhood. They have no national aspirations because if they did, they could have had a country in 1948 and in 1956 and in, uh, numerous times. They could have had a country. And I'm so, so, so glad that you mentioned and emphasized this because when I talk about, you know, how when you said that Gaza could have been a Singapore, people laugh at me. And it's mind boggling because it was 20 years ago. And most people don't even have a historical awareness what happened 20 years ago. So it's, it's, it's really hard to go against what we see today on social media, especially when we see an absolutely destroyed Gaza and that victimizes, you know, the people in Gaza and makes Israel to be blamed. But it 
didn't look like like 20 years ago. They were given, uh, as you said, a very high level infrastructure that was built by Israel. So yeah, I just wanted to point it out and, and reiterate because that message often gets lost in this you know, maze that we are in. Okay. And some of those hospitals where the Hamas are, are holding their headquarters in the basements, those are hospitals that Israel helped build there. Right. And, right. you know, this sounds like a fairy tale today, but in the early 1990s, there were plans not far from where I live to build a maternity hospital near the Kisufim crossing of the time where Gazans and women from the Western Negev, from where I live, would have been able to come to that hospital and have their babies. Mm. So the Gazans just lost and keep losing so much by, by not working with us, by not accepting our presence. Right. And, and using what we could be giving them and helping them with them. We want to. We're always holding our hands out in peace yeah. and to help them. And, yeah. and there was something I wanted to say, and it it gone <laughs> from before. Um, we, we have so many activities that we've done with Gazans, educational activities, and ah, I remember what I wanted to say. There is a woman on Instagram called Imshin, the Gaza you don't see. Mm -hmm. You can go onto her account and see the beauty of Gaza, the wealth of Gaza. They kept saying they're an open air prison and there's an embargo and a blockade. And there are areas in Gaza that are so luxurious and so beautiful with fountains and luxurious homes right. that people don't know about. And yeah. they had so much there. And today, because of October 7th, those areas are parking lots. Yeah. They've lost so much again, again, by, by, by attacking us. And you can't just... Mm -hmm attack people in a sovereign country and expect to not get hell's bells blown out of you you can't yes. you can't do that and i really 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 hate this kind of like babying the people in gaza in that sense that they are not responsible for their present and future if we want good for the gazans and for me in a way you just re-echo that uh, sentiment you know obvious enemy is Hamas and not Israel and seeing how many people can grasp it that if I want something good for the Palestinians then I'm fighting together against their leadership and then I can really project a better life for those people so it really breaks my heart and when we see these videos then the comment lines you know oh it's Israeli propaganda or it's not true and that's a whole different topic, you know, that we could go into how everything that Israel says is a propaganda, but everything that comes out of Hamas and the terrorist organization as an axiom and a fact. So let's go back to your story, because it really is. I, I, I like how you started with the timeline, you know, that that was the past and then it shifted. What happened after 2005? How did your life beside the Gaza border changed? So we started getting our first rockets in about 2006. Before that, when the Hamas started coming into power around 2000 already. And, and they, at first they were shooting at Sterot because it's a city and a much easier target to hit than isolated Kibbutzim. They were using very rudimentary weapons and we got our first in 2006 and that's when we started building protection around, first of all, around the children's houses, which by then were daycare centers, mm -hmm. but you can't have 10 babies in a daycare center with two workers and, and not have it completely safe so that they don't have to, if there's a red alert, if the, when, when we get incoming rocket warning, we have between zero to 10 seconds. From the second you hear that alarm, 
until the second you hear the explosion. Zero to ten seconds. So you're working seconds. with children. Zero to ten. Mortars do not always trigger the early warning system. So we don't always have a warning even. In fact, a few weeks ago, on my kibbutz, there was an explosion. An anti-aircraft -air missile was shot at a helicopter, an Israeli helicopter, now during wartime. It missed the helicopter, but went straight into our infirmary wall, the doctor's office. Nobody was there because we're not home. But there was no warning for that. And that would have killed whoever would have been in that office at the time, in the doctor's office. So, so just to, just just for one second, for everyone you know who is listening to put you on the map, how many kilometers or miles you are from the border? We're a little over a mile for, from the border, about two kilometers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, hmm. um, so in 2006, we started getting rockets, and the first war situation that I personally experienced was in 2008-9, um, when, and at that point, we did not have safe rooms. So if you heard an incoming rocket warning, you had to, every house, every, every person, every family had to decide where the safest area in their house was. And my, a safe area being an area that has no external walls or windows so that shrapnel couldn't enter. So yeah. our safe so Back then, there was no regulation that every house needs a safe, route, safe room? No. Wow. No. Okay. It, they, the law changed in about 1996, I think. They changed the law that every new house had to have a safe room. Our house, none of our, maybe five houses at the kibbutz that were the five newest houses had safe rooms at the time. So for that war, I did not have the wherewithal to stay behind in a war zone without a safe place to be. I had just, my husband suffered from bipolarity mm. and he committed suicide in November, 2008. So this was less than a month after I lost my husband in such tragic, sudden um, circumstances. So I did not have time, uh, the wherewithal to remain behind in a war zone with no place safe to be and in that situation so for that round of violence i evacuated it and it wasn't called a war mm -hmm. because it, it was called operation because yeah. if it had been called a war like it is now they would have had to ev evacuate everybody but okay so it was okay. an operation my kibbutz was very organized and we had prepared for this ahead of time years ahead in 2006 7 we already had plans for evacuation in case of escalation so for that war we were organized two days after it started the operation started kids and families were on buses and evacuated to someplace safe in the middle of the country and after this operation the government of israel realized that you cannot have people living zero to ten seconds away from disaster without doing something to take care of them. The mm -hmm. old bomb shelters that we used to have that were fine in uh, the Sinai campaign and the Yom Kippur war were useless. We have like six bomb shelters in my entire community. We're 450 people. So they built um, a safe room on every, every home in our community. Within nine months, everybody had a safe room. It was an amazing project. So mm. after that, the next operation that happened in 2012, I was already stronger. I'd built my resilience from, from losing my husband from my own personal tragedy, and I had simply safe to be. And I felt it was very important to stay behind in order to bear witness. Because yes, I wanted to ask you. I really wanted to 
ask you like what makes people like you and i've been hearing so many stories also during my last trip to israel is that all of you want to stay there you don't want to leave that's home but what keeps you there it's like such a psychological terror that you are living under day after day and that's again i think it's such an underestimated part of this whole situation because people always say you know and argue that oh more people die on the other side yeah the only reason not more people die on the israeli side is simply because of the defense system that israel has built up but the psychological terror is enormous on communities like you and everyone who needs to you know uh, look for a shelter within 10 seconds tops what keeps you there so we call it 95 percent heaven because 95 percent of the time it really is heaven on earth there's there's um crime is zero the it, it's a like a gated community so kids can play out on the grass and and you don't have to worry about them usually On October 7th, the 95% flip to 100% hell. So to, if, to go to my story about October 7th, October mm -hmm. 6th, we had um, a big party on my kibbutz where one of the uh, historical kibbutz that in 1946, Ben-Gurion wanted to have a presence, a Jewish presence in the Negev desert so that when we would get finally gained statehood we would have communities in the negative so my community was one of 11 communities that set out uh the night after yom kippur in the middle of the night to build a settlement and we always celebrate at, on so at the end of sukkot mm -hmm. on simchat torah so our community had um a joyful festival on october 6th and before I went to bed, my, my daughter was in charge of uh, the cultural activities and she separated from her husband. So he was with my three grandchildren so that she would be able to do her job. Mm -hmm. So it was a great party. And my son, who lives in Tel Aviv, came to visit and stay for the weekend because it was his birthday on October 8th and he wanted to be there for the celebrations. And, and he was due to fly abroad uh like the week after so he came to be with us for the weekend so before i went to bed I, I told him um if you don't see me in the morning don't worry i want to go outside before sunrise and take pictures of a field of wildflowers before before the sun rises thankfully i was too tired to get up that morning and to go out because if i had if I hadn't been too tired, I would not be sitting here and talking to you today. Because the place where I was going to go at a quarter to six in the morning, by 6.15, it was full of terrorists. And people were murdered there. Um, um, 6.30 in the morning, we started getting incoming rocket warnings. And they were coming at unusually heavy heavy pace it, we could see it was a very very heavy barrage and of course i ran into my safe room where my son was sleeping because that's my guest room and it was such a heavy barrage that that we realized that something very unusual was happening what i didn't realize at the time was that it was camouflage to take the attention away from what, the main event which was happening along the border were thousands of Hamas terrorists and Islamic Jihad terrorists were invading Israel at the same time. A very well-planned, well-orchestrated attack on army bases, on 22 different communities along the border, all at the same time, overwhelming the defense systems, overwhelming the army, and and uh, about half an hour later, we got messages on our internal messaging system saying that Israel had been invaded, that we should go outside our safe room, 
to lock our doors, close our windows, and go back into the safe room and lock our safe room doors. What was your first feeling here? Because I, I hear a lot from your peers that they doubted it. They didn't want to believe. They were like, oh, it's, it's, it cannot be. So if you look on, I, I have a group on, on Facebook called Life on the Border with Gaza with 12,000 followers by now. And if you look, look back to October 7th in Life on the Border, you will see me doing a Facebook Live. I did a few Facebook Lives. One of them was me walking with my phone, doing a Facebook Live, closing the windows and saying, I don't really think this is going to be necessary because we have the army and we have the fence around us and the army will get to them before they get to us. And, but, you know, I'll humor them. I'll, I'll close everything. The problem with the instructions that we got was that you cannot lock a safe room door because the safe rooms were built to keep us safe from rockets. They were not built with any intention to be able to keep us safe from infiltration because that was not an option that was on the table. So what we realized was that in order to keep it in any sense locked, you had to pull down the handle because by pulling uh -huh. down the handle to the door, you have prongs that go into the, into the framework. Uh -huh. So that, that keeps you safe as long as the person who's holding the handle down is stronger than uh -huh. whoever's on the other side trying uh -huh. to open it. So at, at one point, about 20 minutes later, again, we see messages coming through our internal messaging system saying, we hear gunshots. Now, I know what a rocket exploding sounds like mm -hmm. and a mortar. I've never heard automatic machine fire, gunfire in, in my community. And that's what people were hearing. Mm -hmm. They're saying we're hearing gunfire. We're hearing Arabic outside our walls. And then all of a sudden we're getting messages. They're inside our house. They're here. They're trying to open the safe room door. They're setting our house on fire. And all these cries saying, where are the army? Where's the IDF? Where's the, where's the police? Where's the fire department? Where are all the, the, the forces that are supposed to be coming to save us? Yeah. Crickets. Crickets. We get you no giving... formal information. We have no formal information about what is going on outside. Now, in my safe room, I have a TV on the wall. And usually when there are escalations, I keep that on because, as I said, I, I'm doing Facebook Lives. I'm reporting from the safe room. And it's important to me to keep track of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, not long into this, when I understood that there were terrorists inside my community, I turned off the TV because I realized that I have enough to keep track of by just figuring out where they are. I don't need that, that what's going on in Sirot, in, in Be'eri, in, in other places. Yeah. is too much information of that course. I don't need. I'm in survival mode. I have to keep track of what's going on here, and I know where everybody lives in my kibbutz. So I'm following the progression of the terrorists as they get closer and closer to my house. How, how many people live in your kibbutz? So how big is that? About kibbutz? 450 people, plus there were guests. I mean, there were people mm -hmm. that because were away because it was mm -hmm. vacation, but there were many guests, like my son, that stayed overnight. For the weekend, it was holiday, it was vacation, and, and we had a lot of guests the night before. So can you so, walk us through of that morning, like you are in the safe room with your son, what happens? So we're watching the progression as the terrorists are getting nearer and closer and closer, and we start hearing gunshots as well, and we start hearing Arabic outside our doors. And I looked at my son, and 
and he looked at me. We told each other that we loved each other and basically said goodbye. I was sure I was not going to see another sunrise. Absolutely sure. We were just sitting there waiting for them to burst in the door. And my son is sitting in front of the door, holding down the handle. And all of a sudden we heard the voices in Arabic much closer. And my son said, they said, they said, come away from there. We didn't understand what that was about. Um, after a while, while things seemed to quiet down and in the safe room we had no water and no bathroom and this was about 10 o'clock already in the morning i was in physical pain i had to go to the bathroom i was not going to do that in front of my son people did it in the safe room if they had a, a box or, or a box. my son urinated in a bottle i'm not built that way so I opened the door very quietly, very cautiously, and I saw opposite the door to my safe room that the slats on my window had been broken. So the terrorists started breaking into my house. They were on my porch. And whether it's divine intervention or dumb luck or my late husband watching over us, Something called them away. Around the same time, unbeknownst to me, my grandchildren, who were in their safe room with my son-in-law, who is one of the first responders, so he was armed, but he couldn't go out to be with the other first responders because my granddaughters aged two, six, and eight would couldn't be left alone. All of a sudden, he hears the terrorists entering his house. He told the girls, cover yourselves with a blanket. Don't come out from under the blanket. You're going to hear a loud noise. Just stay there. He hears the terrorists in the house breaking things, screaming, Allah Akbar, and, and he was waiting with his gun. And as as soon as he heard a terrorist near the safe room door, he threw the door open and shot the terrorist dead right in front of the safe room. Hmm. He saw two other terrorists escaping. He was going to go after them, but he realized that there were numerous terrorists that were highly armed just outside his house. He figured he'd cut his losses. He went back in, closed the door sat in front of the safe room with his gun raised and armed and waited for anyone who came through that door because they would have gotten a bullet. They were, sh they, they were shouting outside and shooting at the window and, and, and at his house. And he was, they were surrounded and they weren't pleased to put it lightly. Right. Around the same time, other terrorists were setting fire to people's houses. And we're, we're seeing messages on the, on, on the WhatsApp group, on the internal messaging system, saying, for, for, especially from this one family who, who had a 10-day-old baby with them in their safe room. Now, the ter terrorists had tried to enter the safe room they tried to open it, but the two parents held the door, held that handle down. They didn't manage to open the door, but they managed to dislodge it from the frame. So mm. when they set the house on fire, the smoke was able to enter the safe room. And we're seeing these messages from this family saying, we're, our house is on fire and the smoke is entering the safe room. Where are the, Where's the help? We need help. We need, we need somebody to come and get us out. Our first responders, four of whom were out 
put there that day because the others were either like my son-in-law couldn't leave the house or not at the not on the kibbutz so four of them were there but there were tens of terrorists and while they killed a number of them around this family's house they weren't able to get to them mm -hmm. they were on the phone with um uh first aid responders in jerusalem and the person was walking them through what you should do how you should help your son to, to, to have him low on the ground because smoke rises. And at one point they told them, open the safe room window just a little bit so you could get air. They put the baby on, on, on the windowsill so he could get some fresh air. We were on our own on Kibbutz Nirim. Tell me that. Until sir. one thirty afternoon at seven hours, after the nightmare began, the first troops came to Nirim. Seven and in fact, hours later. Seven hours later. And of course, they went. I interviewed one of the first, one of the troops that came to us just a couple of weeks ago. And he to told me they were supposed to have gone. They had gotten orders to go to another kibbutz, but they were getting these frantic calls from this family with the, ba with the 10 day old baby. So they took, took a decision to come to Nirim. So this, this 10 day old baby, who is fine and healthy, saved, saved our kibbutz in many ways. He saved so many oh, of us. Um, what we didn't know, and we only found out about two months ago, was that, in fact, at 7 in the morning, the southern commander, 6.30, he, he was in the base nearby, the base that was with the soldiers that were supposed to come and save us. He realized that something extreme was happening. He got in a car with two of his soldiers and drove to see what was happening in the fields. As he drove by Nirim, he realized that there were already terrorists inside our kibbutz. He drove around to the other entrance and came in, and he was the first soldier with his, the two other soldiers with him that, um, that fought against the terrorists that were there. This was at 7 o'clock in the morning. He, he was wounded, seriously. The other soldiers, the two other soldiers tried to save him and, and fight off the terrorists. They succumbed to terrorist fire, not before killing a number of the, the leaders of the terrorist group, mm -hmm. the Nukba. And um, the uh, other leaders that were there realized that they had a very high ranking soldier that they'd killed and they wanted to get credit for it. They took his, they threw his body and the other soldiers' bodies on a vehicle and drove back, back to Gaza with them. Which meant that the, the terrorists that were left in Nirim, there were fewer terrorists, some of them were killed, some of them left, but they had no leaders on Nirim. They didn't have the game plan. So they went house to house without a plan, burning, killing, capturing whoever they could. When the soldiers arrived at 1.30, they went straight to Uriel, the father of this baby, extricated them, killed the, so the terrorists that were around them, extricated them from their house and the other people from their houses that were being burned. And then they went house to house. We were told not to open the door under any circumstances, unless we are sure mm -hmm. that there's somebody, unless we're sure that they're IDF soldiers. On the other hand, we got information that many of these Nukba soldiers were dressed up as IDF. Right. And some of them spoke Hebrew. Enough to say in Hebrew, it's the IDF, it's the army. So even when 
the soldiers came to us, people were scared to open the door. People were scared to come out. So when they came to us, we heard the, the first responders from Nirim divided themselves among the different teams that were going house to house so that they knew the people that were in there and could call out their names and could talk to them. And, and you know, there were a few, there was an instance in at least one of the kibbutzim where they took a hostage and at gunpoint, they made the hostage call out the family's name and say, this is Yossi, it's okay, you can come out. And oh captured people that way. So it was, it, it, I was in the same room with my son until about 5.15. Wow. 11 hours, 11 hours in petrifying, deathly fear, waiting for the end to come. Because even when the soldiers were there at one thirty, and we knew that they were in the kibbutz, we didn't know where they were. We didn't know where there were other terrorists in the meantime still attacking and killing and infiltrating. Right. Adela, I don't want to have a lead up question, so please answer the way you want to answer. Um, there are so many testimonies that I heard in which they said that these terrorists openly and publicly cheered for every killing that they committed so that they were really happy for every death that they could quote unquote achieve. Did you hear while you were in the safe room, did you hear any sort of, you know, cheering or anything that would uh, also support these testimonies that the, the massacre on October 7th was actually a joyful act for those people infiltrating into Israel? So after the wave of the Nukba came the Shababim, and the Shababim were just people, men, men, women, children came into the kibbutzim to loot and, and, and destroy and plunder, and they just took stuff, whatever they could. So I personally did not hear, um, I heard a lot of Arabic. I didn't know, I didn't understand what I was hearing. I'm hearing, hearing impaired. So I, I also didn't, there were things that I didn't hear. Mm -hmm. I, I know I spoke to somebody from Nir Oz, which is the kibbutz just next door, the kibbutz that was hit much harder than, that, uh, than us, because of, you know, I keep saying there were many tragedies that day, but there were also many little, miracles. there were a number of little miracles. So for us, the little miracles were that brave soldier, the three soldiers that lost their lives and, and saved many of us. The miracle that, that these soldiers came to us, they were meant to go someplace else, but they came to us. Um, the fact that there was a helicopter nearby that was in touch with, with our first, our, our security head that told him where, where to shoot at so that they would be able to get terrorists. So, so Nirim was, was supposed to have been like Niroz mm -hmm. because the same terrorist planned both attacks on both of our communities. Niroz lost one out of every four, one out of four, murdered, kidnapped, dis disappeared. So an acquaintance that I have from Niroz told me that he was in his safe room holding down the handle. They shot at his safe room. Many, the, the, the terrorist that had a Klutchnikov, the clutch shoots through the door. Mm -hmm. Terrorists that had, had M16s, those didn't shoot, shoot through the door. So he said that his door was shot at and it didn't penetrate. 
but he heard people in his house, voices of women, as you said, celebrating. You know, you know women. You know women. That that is like when I'm like I want to scream out of pain, and I don't even understand how you guys are holding up with all the preservance that you have and the strengths when you hear women and as you mentioned earlier children so we often say you know hamas really is the problem but by now the general population in gaza at least this is my experience and my knowledge have been so brainwashed with all this ideologically driven hatred and we know you know from the UNRWA education and everything that literally kids were okay to go there with their mother and loot other people's homes that is just like a whole different level of issues that we need to deal with but I don't, I don't know, know what happened um, yes. I don't know if you're aware but today they announced that there is proof that 30 UNRWA workers yes. actively participated in the October 7th massacres. Yes. That, is, that is a major topic. And um, for me, you know, when people say that, oh, it is not anti-Israelism or, or Jew hatred, the biggest and the strongest argument against that is this, that should that happen to any other countries that a United Nations agency is actively involved or has employees that are actively employed, and we are not having an international outburst and scandal against that. That is again underlying for me how much hypocrisy and double standard is against Israel, and it comes down to Jew hatred, an organization that was created to foster peace, and yet its own employees are part of a terrorist attack. That should have so much consequences that the whole institution should be shut down and it's not happening. So that is like a whole discussion, you know, we could have a different hour on it. I want to really know from a human perspective, what happened after, the day after? How did you? So feel, first, like, of all, on, first of all, on the day, five people were slaughtered on Nirim, mm -hmm. five people were kidnapped. Do we know anything three about of them, Three kidnapped. of them were released. I don't know if you can see this. Two, two of them, Nadav, Popovel, Yegev Burshtav. 133 days, 133 days, still in the Gazan prisons. Now, Nadav, was kidnapped two houses away from me, two houses, oh my God. houses away, with his mother, with his 78-year-old mother. Hannah was released back in November, mm -hmm. and Rimon was kidnapped with his wife. Uh, sorry, Yagev was kidnapped with his wife, Rimon. Rimon was also released. As uh, uh, until they were released, they were together. Nadav and his mother and Rimon and Yegev were together. So when they were released, they knew that Nadav and Yegev were still alive mm -hmm. and still okay. We don't know. And time is running out. We see, we see how many hostages have been murdered there. We see how many hostages have been killed from friendly fire from mistakes yeah there there are hostages with medical conditions that have died there and to, on today's news also they said that they found medicines yeah. with names of hostages on them that had clearly not arrived at the yeah. hostages so what is the role of the Red Cross. What is their job, if not to go in and find these people? The, the people that work for the Red Cross are mostly Gazans as well. Why haven't they gone in? Why, aren't they, why isn't the world demanding that they go in 
at least give an update on the hostages. Where yeah, the, the, else in the world would this happen? The questions are many. And as again, I can't reiterate how it is painful for me, but then I can't imagine what you are going through. So we have 10 minutes, such a short time to deal with so many human emotions and so many questions that still, still come up in me. And maybe we are going to, you know, continue this conversation as a follow up in a couple of weeks again. But as I said, I feel frustration in your voice, but I also know you from our previous conversation that you don't feel revenge. And I want to feel, I want to understand how you are dealing with the aftermath as a human being, as an Israeli, as a mother, as a woman. Tell me a little bit about, about how you feel, really. So first of all, on October 8th, we were evacuated from our kibbutz. We were in a hotel in Eilat uh, for, for three months, which is fine for me. I'm on my own, but fam families with young children were going crazy many of them left before our time finished because they just couldn't anymore mm -hmm. finally today all of our kibbutz have been relocated to beersheba okay. today okay hey the final families got their apartments volunteers from all over israel came to help clean the apartments to help put together the ikea furniture to to have it you know, I, I moved into this apartment three weeks ago. I opened the door to a beautifully furnished apartment, prepared lovingly for me with plants and, and, and a cake and, and messages of, of welcoming. And Am Yisrael just came out in all its glory and and have just been so wonderful so so here i am on on the 21st floor that's 20 floors above where i'm used to living normally and it makes it of course much more comfortable until we can finally go home which we have no idea when that's going to be and i've been home a few times i've been home i think six times and oh. lately, since we've come to uh, Bershev, I've been going once a week to bring pr prospective donors around to tell my story, like I'm doing now, but boots on the ground. And I walk, right. them, I walk them through Uriel's house, and I take them past where Doron and my were slaughtered. And I show them, this is our home. This was in the heart of a community that looks like suburban America. This, this could be anybody, anybody's home. Right. I survived that day. And as a survivor, I feel an obligation to do what I can. And what I can is to talk our story and to right. tell people about it. Because not everybody was as lucky as me on the yeah. Other side of this dog tag that I wear, I put the, the names of my friend Judy and her brother Gadi, her husband Gadi, who were from the Rose, were walking in the fields on their sunrise walk and were slaughtered on their walk. Judy taught mindfulness. She was an English teacher. She taught children mindfulness she was a vegetarian she she believed in peace i put their names on the back of this dog tack in the on the first week hoping that when they would come back i would give it back to them I, i'm not going to be able to give it back to them because we know know that they were one of the ones that were slaughtered on october 7th brutally abducted their bodies were abducted to gaza and their remains are in gaza to this day 133 days i mean this is this is the moment when me as a human being 
being me as a reporter or a journalist, I just don't really have the words to to convey what I feel and how much I want to give you and your whole community a hug. It it doesn't uh, fall short on me that you say you say you know that you feel an obligation to share your story. And I recently met a lone soldier, and he said the same. And I think it's incredible incredible strengths that you all are showcasing with the, with the desire to share the story. But as a human being, it also hurts me that we need to put you into these positions that you need to share your story because people question, because people don't really want to believe of, of the level of atrocities that went down, that people are still, you know, literally trashing Israel for the ret retaliation. And we forget that you are humans as well and one of the things i i highlight in my in my speech which is to communities is that on october 8 people were already marching against israel on the streets in america on october 8 israel was not even attacking back as an answer on israel 8 on, on october 8 sorry people were still trying to wake up from from what happened how could it happen What's going on? And so the Jewish community couldn't even have one day to mourn peacefully. And that is something that I want to talk more about because everyone is about human rights and how we need to, you know, like, oh, people in Gaza. And what about the Jewish communities who literally faced the biggest massacre against them since the Holocaust? And yet, didn't even have one day to make some kind of sense of what happened. So this just being as a human to human, I, I, I look up to you so much that I can't even put, them, put this level of, of respect I have towards you and your community members into words because the strengths, the resilience, there is something extremely special in Israel that I don't think anyone else experiences. Whenever I go to Israel, I, I become a better person and I become more resilient through your stories. And so I don't take it lightly that you came and shared this with us today. And I know you are still not at home, but at least one step closer to home. So all, all I can say is you are not alone. We are with you. And I'm really confident and based on also the feedbacks that I'm seeing during our conversation here, that if your time allows, I want to continue this talk in a couple of weeks again, and then we can continue, you know, from what happened after and, and go dive into later, like deeper into the aftermath of October 7th. But I would like to close this interview with you with one thing. And since it's Shabbat also, perhaps it's very much of a nice ending. What is your message? to the people here in America who would still be on the streets right now harassing Jews, Jewish organizations, Jewish businesses, harassing, you know, anyone who is Israeli and they are scandaling that it didn't happen or from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What is one thing that you would want them to know? You know, I'm very confused. American liberal society have, have always have, have always been ones to stand up for the underdog to to help the those who who are, are in danger and and in need of help and what what they don't understand is that the Jews are facing an existential threat. We, we're in the endangered species, be it with anti-Semitism, be it here from, from, from Jew hatred, anti-Zionism that, that we're having to deal with here. How is the world not standing up and saying, we have to protect our Jews? because they are going to be extinct right and 
and the ones that are most liberal and and the most going out there and 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 mimicking the 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 Palestinian genocidal war cry from the river to the sea, they're the ones that would be killed first by the the uh, radical Islamics, the LBGTQ, the the the.